Well, good morning. This is the Lou Rockwell Show, and uh, what an honor it is to have as our guest today, Mr. Bob Luddy. Bob is uh, an entrepreneur, and uh, he's uh, author of The Entrepreneurial Life, The Path from Startup to Market Leader. He's the founder and president of Captive Air Systems, the leading manufacturer of commercial kitchen ventilation systems in North America. Uh, he was 90, In 2007, he was awarded the Ludwig von Mises Entrepreneurship Award for his entrepreneurial success and devotion to the free market ideal. And we're honored to have Bob serve on the board of the Mises Institute as well. Uh, he's a U.S. Army veteran uh, during the war in Vietnam. And uh, maybe we'll talk about a little bit about that at the end, Bob, about uh, what you describe as service and socialism. But... Uh, Really, besides your extraordinary work with the Captive Air, you're an educational entrepreneur. You started a very successful charter school. You started a very successful Catholic school. And then you've started a chain of, I think there are now eight Thales Academies uh, that go from pre-K to 12. And um, thousands and thousands of students in North Carolina uh, attending your schools and, and learning things that are very unlike what they would learn in the public schools. Uh, or for that matter, in the average private school. So this is all extraordinary. Um, but I was just thrilled to see recently that you're starting a college. You're starting a Thales College. Thales, um, tell us first why you named naming these things after Thales, because he was the first mathematician, the first philosopher. Lou, that's exactly right. Uh, we we focus on Western civilization. Uh, classic curriculum and traditional values. So we went all the way back to Thales, and it's uh, it served us very well. And I think it's created the right image and environment for our students. Uh, the reason I wanted to start the college was that when I went to college um, in the '60s, it cost about a thousand dollars a year tuition. Uh, I was a commuter, and we received a very good education. Well, everybody knows that college costs have grown exponentially, and in some cases, uh, quality has degraded. Certainly, liberty and free speech is highly degraded. So it, it was a natural evolution for us to think of, if we have students graduating from Thales schools, we don't want them to go to a college that's either way too expensive or may teach them the wrong values. It's just it's just extraordinary, and I'm I'm just going to read some of the some of the curriculum that Thales College is going to have: um, grammar, logic, rhetoric one and two, finance, mathematical reasoning, ethics, and American uh, political thought. Uh, also, uh, the great books. Total of uh, eight required courses when students read selected books in their entirety, and and uh, I love the fact that you are flipping the classroom. Uh, because uh, at Thales College, the students will do their reading outside of the classroom, and the classroom will be a time for Socratic questioning of the students about their their learning. And this, of course, is the most uh, extraordinary way of teaching. Uh, I think there are no law schools anymore that, that teach the Socratic method, but uh, thank goodness Thales College is going to be, is going to be doing that. And at what what is a very a highly discounted price as compared to uh, the rest of the American colleges. Yeah, you, Lou, you'll like this, that uh, the 32000 that it would cost for, for uh, three years of Thales, which this is a three-year program to complete what would be a four-year degree in most places, because we're going to have three semesters per year. If you look at what I paid at 1000 a year, 4000 total, and you inflated that, it would be about $32,000. That's exactly what we're charging. And to me, that makes complete sense that why should you pay more today for a college education inflation adjusted than you did 50 years ago? Uh, and I think that our uh, parents are really enthused about the idea that they can pay as they go, their parents can help them, and hopefully most of them can end up graduating from college with no debt and a great education. <laughs> no, it's just... Uh, most of these kids, as you as you mentioned, end up with horrendous debts. Really, they can be um, life changing debts that uh, warp their their futures. And uh, the fact that one can possibly work one's way through college, 
uh, as was possible uh, when you and I went and when Ron Paul went, for example. He worked his way through college. He ended up with no debt, of course. It would have been unheard of. And um, you're, you're going back uh, in all the best senses to not only uh, in, in terms of the curriculum, but in terms of the structure of the college, the cost of the college. And also, of course, no, taking no federal money and uh, not seeking accreditation. And, of course, the accreditation um, uh, organizations tend to be very left-wing and require various left-wing things by the colleges and universities they accredit. So it's, it's, it's just tremendously exciting. And uh, are, have you gotten any uh, indication that the regular colleges are worried about this? Uh, we've had comments from a number of college presidents that said this is something that if it takes off would be very worrisome. <laughs> <laughs> Darn right. <laughs> no, it's just, and this would be, you're going to locate this in uh, uh, North Carolina, in uh, Wake Forest. Wake Forest, yeah, beautiful town. It'll be in Wake Forest, North Carolina. Yep. I can't tell you how thrilling this is. I mean, you're threatening all of that's bad in American higher education and giving students something that's so good, uh, good for their moral lives, good for their intellectual lives, teaching a very strong work ethic. Uh, to get through in three years, they've got to really work hard. And uh, you're acquiring uh, significant uh, SAT scores or ACT scores to get in. It's just tremendous. Yeah, one of the things I wanted to point out, Lou, is that uh, we're doing a number of things that are different. College, to some degree, has been a prerequisite to, to get a good job. And sometimes students tend to think of, well, I'm just going through the motions so I can get through college and then I'll go get this good job. But then they're not very well prepared for the job. Our approach is going to be to say to the student, you're going to have to work really hard at Thales College. For example, all students will have to be in attendance eight until noon every single day. It's a requirement. So they're going to learn the discipline of the workplace. <clears throat> the second thing we're doing is to put the burden on the student and saying, you're here for only one purpose, to develop your intellectual capabilities along with the formation of your character. And you have to do most of that work. We have a program that will help you do that, and we have the professors that will help you, but the burden is on you to learn and to grow and to engage. So the student's not going to be able to just slide through as they might in some colleges. They're going to have to be very engaged. They're going to have to do their homework and be prepared for Socratic discussions, uh, the Oxford tutorial system we're using, means that every student weekly will meet with their professor and those meetings will be formatted and they will the purpose of them is to make sure the student is fulfilling the requirements and developing themselves to the highest potential and learning the academics. There's not going to be any way to just slide through Thales College. You're going to have to put a lot of work and I and it's going to produce a different type of student coming out that can communicate, think, knows how to access knowledge, knows how to self-learn, and knows how to seek knowledge from people who have, you know, greater expertise than they do. I tell you, I was just, it's a thrilling prospect. And my guess is that it's true that the whole uh, college establishment is worried uh, because you can put a lot of these places out of business. Uh, I would say they don't deserve to be in business. And um, when will the first class be? We're hoping to start classes next uh, July. We're still in the organizational phase, but if everything works well, it's next July. Worst case, we would start in midsummer uh, 2020. So we know that you're looking for smart students, dedicated students, kids who are not afraid of hard work. Uh, but tell us about the the kind of professors you're looking for. We're looking for, my view of professors and teachers is only the very best matter in the long run. So we're not looking for any average professors. Uh, my ideal professor would be someone like Dr. Bill Peterson, who was a student of Mises, mm -hmm. a friend of the Mises Institute for many years. Great man. Because he knew how to engage students and he knew how to um, cultivate an interest 
that made you really want to learn the the uh, subject. Uh, as you know, he taught me Austrian economics in my adult life. So we're looking for top-notch professors who are going to engage students in a very deep level and develop them to the highest level possible. Tremendous. And tell us something about the Socratic method of teaching. The Socratic method um, requires the student to engage and to discuss. And I've, before they can do that, they first have to know the subject matter. They have to be very familiar with it. And they have to be able to, to uh, engage other students. So the professor will lead the Socratic method. Um, but in that process, students will learn from each other and they'll learn from the professor. And they'll also find out when they're wrong or when they're not up to the level they should be in a particular subject. So this continuous dialogue forces engagement that you don't get just from a lecture in a classroom. Every summer during the Mises University uh, at uh, the Mises Institute, Judge Andrew Napolitano comes and teaches a course for us in constitutional history. And um, the students are required to read a, a huge number of Supreme Court decisions. And then he engages them in the Socratic method. And it's, it's, this is very rare, although you're going to make it a lot less rare. It's a very rare method of teaching. But the students, uh, uh, even though they're put on the spot, uh, in, uh, end up enjoying it. They end up learning a lot. And it's just fun to, uh, to watch the whole process. Yeah, one thing I learned in my career and then from Dr. Peterson and other professors is concepts can be difficult to fully understand and even more difficult sometimes to apply. The professor helps you unlock that important knowledge that maybe you don't get from reading the book. And that's one of the purposes, I think, of the Socratic method. I think the students will be much more engaged. They'll find it very interesting. And as they learn more, they'll have an appetite to move to higher levels of learning. You know, I, I think virtually every college and university in this country is left-wing. Uh, their whole attitude is left-wing, uh, politically correct, and they typically um, teach that boys are the scum of the earth. And, of course, I think that's the reason why uh, colleges tend to have so many more girls than boys these days, but that none of that is going to be happening at Thales College. No, it won't. Uh, when I was in college, as long as we did it respectfully, we could engage professors in arguments and disagreements. And that was important because sometimes, or maybe oftentimes, we were wrong and the professor corrected us. But that engagement is important. You have an idea, put your idea out there, discuss it, learn whether it's valid or not valid. But to force political correctness on students undermines the whole idea of the college and the university to explore and, and to seek the truth. Uh, so, yeah, there will be no political correctness at the Ailey's Academy. <laughs> I tell you, it's a very exciting prospect. It's a frightening prospect for the bad guys. A thrilling prospect for the good guys, and I can see that uh, parents from around the country are going to want to send their uh, their children to your college. Will there be dorms? Will there be uh, students will find their own housing? How is this how is this going to be handled? Yeah, they'll have to find their own housing, no dorms. Great. That takes a huge burden away. Um, yes. As a frame of reference, when I went to LaSalle University in the mid-60s, about two-thirds of the students commuted. Mm-hmm. Some may have lived in apartments. Many lived at home. It, it was a complete non-issue. And those students, many of them also worked at the same time, were very engaged. Um, one of the things that we're looking at at Thales College is to get students involved in mentorships and to some type of working during this college experience. Because it's one thing to understand the theory and even correctly understand a concept. It's quite another thing to be able to put it in practice. So I think the idea of doing something in the real world under additional mentorship is important in the overall formation and development of students. 
I wonder if I could mention, uh, if you would tell us about uh, your service in the Army during the Vietnam War and what kind of influence that had on your life and uh, your ideas. Well, a couple of things I could say about the Army. I was drafted out of Philadelphia, went to Fort Bragg for infantry training, and then Fort Dix for advanced infantry. And the one thing that I did learn and that I appreciate from the Army is that both mentally and physically, we're capable of much more than we think we are. So it stretches you to your outer bounds. And that was important in my life in terms of being an entrepreneur, which sometimes can be very challenging. Later on, I was sent to Vietnam, and the day before I went, I met with one of my fellow uh, soldiers, and we tried to rationalize what the war was about. And we came to the conclusion it was about politicians making huge mistakes and not sending their boys, but sending some other boys to war. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look back on it, it, it was not a good thing to be engaged in that war for, for my purposes, any war, unless you're defending the homeland for some reason. So while there was negatives and positives, it's a very positive is that discipline and order in your life is what carries you through life and allows you to take advantage of opportunities that exist. Bob, tell us about the founding of your company. I remember you telling me about uh, the use of water and, and fire as a fire retardant and uh, how you uh, change the type of steel that, that's used. And tell us about um, how you started the company, why you started it, and uh, what you attribute your success to. Well, the way I started the company is not necessarily, I'm not recommending it. I'm just going to tell you how I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I had a job selling uh, fire suppression systems to restaurants. And the company I was working for was a good group, uh, but they weren't making money. So they decided they were going to cut everybody's salary or commissions by about a third, which I felt like was untenable. That was on a Sunday afternoon. By Tuesday night, <clears throat> even though I didn't have any money and uh, was not well organized, I decided I was going to start this company and turned my notice the next day. Thankfully, the company said, well, you can work two days or two weeks, whatever suits you. So I worked two days. So by the end of that week, I was getting organized to start. By Monday the following week, uh, Atlantic Fire Systems, which was our former name, was started, and I both installed fire suppression systems and sold them and serviced them. Now, the company started with no money, so we used the uh, sweat capital system, <laughs> where the capital would have to be generated internally. And there's actually many positive aspects of that. If you don't have any money, it forces you to be more creative, to be very resourceful. And so if I look forward looking in Camp De Vere, resourcefulness is one of our prime underlying values. As we moved along, company inched along. By the end of three years, we had created a million dollars in sales and had a reasonable amount of capital. Wow. Lou, as you know from the book, by the end of year five, things got worse because we were in a pretty bad recession uh, in 1980, mm -hmm. 81. But eventually, we were able to work through it with tenacity and determination. And from that point forward, uh, I set the company on a path to be as creative as possible, to relook at everything that was done in the industry. And as we began to produce kitchen hoods, I realized that the 304 metal, which was standard in the food service industry, was expensive and subject to shocks from uh, commodity prices on uh, international alloys used in the metal. So I did a little research and found that we could buy European metal, uh, 430 stainless steel, which oddly enough was made in Mexico at the time. So we changed the standard for commercial kitchen ventilation to 430. That essentially dropped our price about 20% versus competitors. And also at the same time, we lightweighted the product. You probably know from the 60s and 70s, American products tended to be overbuilt because resources were plentiful and we didn't have a lot of competition. 
So we reduced the amount of stainless steel and the type of stainless steel that gave us close to a 40% raw material advantage over our competition. And over the next 15 years, we became the dominant company. Wow. So by making those two changes and learning how to produce hoods more efficiently, we became the dominant national producer of commercial kitchen ventilation. And I think it's an indication that the way you think is going to be critical to the future. It's one of the things we want to develop within our students. Uh, my mentor, Bill Peterson, a Mises scholar and colleague, stress thinking skills continuously. So rethinking what we're doing constantly is important. And industries tend not to do that. They, over time, they become almost alike. Uh, I, my joke is they follow industry standards. And most of those standards don't serve the customer as well as they should. So our focus has been, how do we serve that customer at a better price, higher quality, and high levels of service? And obviously, that's turned us into a very large company. Well, I would say that uh, people listening to this podcast know what a great man you are, or at least begin to know it, and uh, appreciate not only your, your business success and what you've done for the customers all over North America, but um, what you've done for students is so needed at this time when, when uh, uh, standard elementary and middle school and high school education, college education is so rotten. I mean, so um, it's just amazing what you're doing. Uh, I can just say God bless you. Keep it up. And um, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was a pleasure to be with you, Lou, and thanks for the great work you're doing down at the Mises Institute and teaching Austrian economics, which to me is the truth, and the truth is what sets us free. Bob Luddy, thank you so much. Thank you, Lou. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, thanks so much for listening to The Lou Rockwell Show today. Take a look at all the podcasts. There have been hundreds of them. There's a link on the LRC front page. Thank you. Thank you.